have wanted to do for a very long, long time now. I've actually had this idea rattling around in the back of my head for years. Today, we are going to be taking a look at some old retro gaming magazines, specifically some of my old PC gamer magazines from oh, about 15 to 20 years ago. This is something that I am really looking forward to, and the reason that uh, I haven't done this sooner is because these magazines were uh, stored in my parents' basement, and I wasn't quite sure where. So, finally, uh, a few weeks ago, my brother and I went down there and we dug around until we found the box with all these these magazines uh, in it. Um, I was subscribed to PC Gamer Magazine from uh, about the end of 2001 through to 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. And so I've got a lot of uh, issues of uh, this magazine, and uh, certainly at at least at the beginning of that window, um, this was the main way that I got news about games and uh, hardware and that kind of stuff. And um, when I opened this box of magazines, uh, the nostalgia pretty much punched me in the face, like it was just instantaneous nostalgia. And um, just flipping through some of the covers of these magazines reminded me just how many legendary games came out in that time period. Um, how many uh, games came out at that time which went on to define entire genres and become fundamental to the games that so many of us play now, you know, 20 years later. Um, case in point, this issue right here, uh, it has uh, the GTA 3 review in it, and also up at the top here, the Morrowind review as well, uh, among many other things. And so I thought it would be a lot of fun uh, to go through uh, some of these. Um, and, you know, if you're an old fart like me uh, who was around and gaming at this time, maybe this will be a, a fun stroll down memory lane for you. Um, but if you are younger um, and you were not gaming at this time, perhaps it will be uh, a really neat look into the past at uh, some of the um, these sort of fundamental games which um, laid the groundwork for the games that you are playing today. Um, and also it was just kind of like it was a different time in a lot of ways. And uh, there's some really just kind of fun stuff uh, that I saw just flipping through a few of these issues. So um, that's the plan here. Um, I've picked out a couple of issues that have some uh, games, um, reviews of games that are really uh, important or significant to me um, that I'd like to look at. But um, I have tons of issues, so if there is some game uh, that you would like to see an old review for or, um, you know, an old preview for or something, feel free to let me know in the comments um, because I can always do more of these videos and, um, you know, maybe do some requests or that kind of thing. So I'm not exactly sure how many magazines we're going to get through today. Uh, probably not many because there's a lot in each of these, but we'll just take it slow uh, and enjoy our time paging through uh, some video game history. Um, but before we do that, I, I do have a question for you guys, I must admit. Uh, and that question requires me to tell a, a little story. So, um, I quite frequently get compliments about these t-shirts, about these t-shirts from this video's sponsor, Into the AM. Uh, they make these rad graphic tees, which um, are really very comfortable, um, really easy to care for, but maybe above all, they are really eye-catching with these incredible designs, like this one right here. And um, 
I was wearing this very t-shirt just the other day. I was out for lunch with my mom, <laughs> and um, a fellow from a, a table just a couple over uh, actually came up to me and was like, hey, I really love your t-shirt. Where did you get it? And so I told him, you know, it's from Into the AM. They have all these amazing graphic tees and other stuff as well. You can check out their website online, you know. Um, and, and then I was really close. I was really close to telling him that he could save 10% off his entire order by using offer code the ASMR nerd at checkout. But I stopped myself. I stopped myself because somehow that seemed... I don't know, just very um, conceited of me or something like that. I don't know, just be like, by the way, you can use my offer code to just this random stranger that walked up to me. But then I was thinking about it later and I was like, you know, I probably should have told him because he probably would have liked to save 10%. He genuinely did seem to be really into this design. And, um, you know, it, it would have been a, a win-win because he could have saved some money and a portion of his purchase would have come back to support the channel. So, I guess my question for all of you is this. What would you have done in this situation? Would you tell him that you have a sponsor code that he could use to save some money? Or would you have stayed quiet as I did? My partner Sarah said, well, you should probably just get some business cards and then you can like hand those out and be like, by the way, offer code on there, coupon code for Into the AM. Maybe I should do that as well. I don't know, but I'm genuinely curious what you guys would have done in that scenario. Is it kind of conceited to share a sponsor code like that or, or was that the, would it have been the right thing to do in that situation? Since then, I've had this happen a few more times as well, actually, and I, I still haven't taken that step of telling people IRL, like strangers IRL, that they can save 10% off their entire order at Into the AM by using offer code the ASMR nerd, or in your case, by clicking through on the link down in the video description. But I have no such reservations with all of you here. I am very happy to let you know that Into the AM sponsored this video, that they make awesome, super comfortable, easy to care for clothes, including their flagship graphic tees, like this very eye-catching one right here, and that you can go and check out their entire uh, collection of very uh, comfortable and uh, beautiful clothing uh, using that link down below, and that you, in fact, can save 10% on your entire order by using that link. I have no problem telling you that, but I would like to know your thoughts about telling other random strangers IRL about my affiliate link. So, um, big thank you to Into the AM for sponsoring today's video, and hey, please do let me know what you think down in the comments below. All right, well, without further ado, I think it's time that we jump in and take a closer look at some of these retro PC gamer magazines. Let's do it. And here we have the first issue of PC Gamer Magazine that I have uh, picked out for us to look at here today. It might be the only one that we look at here today on how long it takes us to get through it, but we shall see. This is the July 2002, July 2002 CD-ROM edition. So, these magazines used to come with uh, demo discs, um, and uh, it was a, a CD-ROM full of uh, game demos and uh, like wallpapers and other stuff like that. And uh, I loved, loved, loved those demo discs so much because there was so much cool stuff on them. Um, you must remember this was the days before Steam, before Steam existed or any other such uh, digital distribution platform for games, so physical media was pretty much the only way that you got games, and by extension, 
mention uh, demos. Um, so downloadable demos were practically unheard of at the time. So um, anyway, I, I picked this issue uh, for one specific reason, actually, um, and that is this right here. Uh, this is the issue in which PC Gamer reviewed The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, and it was my first exposure to The Elder Scrolls games. I had not heard of the series before that, and um, The Elder Scrolls games would, of course, go on to be, uh, you know, one of my favorite series of, of all time. And um, quite, um, you know, uh, I mean, a big part of this channel as well, actually, over the years. So um, I thought it would be really cool to go back and look and see what PC Gamer Magazine had to say about Morrowind in the year 2000 when it released. However, as you can tell from uh, cover. There was another uh, very major release right around the same time, which um, interestingly enough would similarly go on to lay the groundwork for uh, open world games in the decades to come. Um, that of course is GTA 3, which many people consider to be sort of the blueprint for how open world games were and and developed uh, over the coming years, or you know the following years, I should say. Um, I would argue that, that both Morrowind and GTA Three had uh, incredibly um, enduring influences on open world video game design um, that are felt to this very day, despite being twenty years old now. Um, but there's other cool stuff in here as well. Neverwinter Nights, Deus Ex 2, the movies. Uh, that's a Peter Molyneux game that I totally forgot about. Um, and much more. So let's start flipping through here. They advertise on the frontier the world exclusive GTA 3 review. So I wonder if this was the first GTA 3 review out. Um, 10 coolest secrets, all the PC upgrades, and cars, girls, and guns, which, you know, despite being a kind of sleazy thing to advertise, I guess, is kind of still the essence of GTA games in a lot of ways, so, although I, I do think they've grown up a bit since then, but... I never actually used the Aurora tool set. 
that, so I can't speak to it personally, but from what I've seen of what people have created with it, it was pretty remarkable from the time. Um, and I must admit, at the time, I also didn't actually play much or play any Neverwinter Nights. I did not have Neverwinter Nights, despite the fact that it was right up my alley, but um, for one reason or another, I never ended up getting it. Um, I think part of it was because uh, for the time, as this is going to sound shallow, but for the time, the graphics were kind of ugly, even by comparison to other 3D games at the time. Um, and so I ended up falling in with the Dungeon Siege, which was another uh, RPG of its time, um, but amazing in its own way, but it was much prettier. So when I had limited spending dollars, that's, that's what I picked. Um, I have since uh, played some Neverwinter Nights, and uh, it is a really cool game that I would like to uh, like to play more of. This was, of course, uh, developed by Bioware. By Bioware. Um, so, also tucked into the front cover there was a pull-out poster, which uh, I guess I never, I never put up on a wall or anything at the time, but uh, looks like it's double-sided. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's a very cool GTA 3 poster. Shots of it in here. Um, 
today's standards, it's it's you know pretty old looking, but there was a, a just a beauty to it that uh, no other game at the time seemed to have, and it just it fueled my imagination in a way that others didn't. Um, and the demo on the disc was actually very generous. Um, I remember it was you know many hours long and also included a big chunk of the multiplayer world, which was a totally separate setting and world, so that was super cool. Um, we've got strategy for Dungeon Siege and GTA 3 here. Uh, how to be a DM in Neverwinter Nights in the features here. What other games? Gosh, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of weird stuff. It might be harder for, hard for younger people these days to appreciate, but, um, you know, back in the day, uh, every game release was kind of significant. Like, there's such a glut of, of every possible kind of game you can imagine these days available at your fingertips on Steam. But, you know, 20 years ago, um, and prior to that, like, even weird kind of niche and uh, oddball games were still covered by, you know, major magazines like this because there just weren't as many games coming out so they could take the, you know, the space in their pages <laughs> to, to talk about these, these more obscure and just kind of weirdo games. And the PC was the king of weirdo games, of course, you know. You got some strange stuff on the consoles, but PC was where you got some really odd stuff from really niche developers back in the day. Here's an ad for Intel. Don't hold your games back. Advertising the Pentium 4. Yeah, the Pentium 4 was actually a very power-hungry CPU at the time and uh, did not compete all that favorably with the the Athlon uh, 64 CPUs that were to come from AMD. They had a letters section in PC Gamer where they would, uh, you know, people could write in. <laughs> I guess they are probably emails maybe. I don't know. Here's a, here's a discussion about the size of, of game boxes. This was around the time that uh, game boxes were switching from like the big, uh, you know, full-size uh, style of the 90s to the more compact sort of DVD case size um, that would characterize the 2000s. Soldier of Fortune. I remember this game was notorious for how gory it was, how violent it was. Uh, this is so cool, you guys. Here is a picture of the Siege Editor, which was a tool set. Um, like I was mentioning, you know, Neverwinter Nights had its Aurora tool set for world building, while the Siege Editor was the same kind of thing, but for Dungeon Siege. And it was less made for, like, DMing and more for, like, just straight up building your own, um, worlds and, uh, mods for the game. It was basically a modding toolkit. I spent many many hours in the Siege Editor, actually, creating my own worlds and stuff. Um, it was a lot of fun. These days, not many people remember Dungeon Siege. Uh, it turned out to be, you know, of Neverwinter Nights and Dungeon Siege. Dungeon Siege was definitely the less enduring of the two, um, but it did go on to a sequel, which was very good, and then a third game, which really bore very little resemblance to the first two and was not as good, but I believe Dungeon Siege is 
owned by Square Enix now, uh, the rights to that game, and I, I doubt we'll ever see uh, another one. Uh, here we have an ad for Warcraft 3, Reign of Chaos. Of course, this was before World of Warcraft existed, so the big going concern for Warcraft was Warcraft 3, the RTS. This is a preview of Deus Ex 2 Invisible War, which uh, was very hyped but could not live up to uh, the legacy of its predecessor. NASCAR Thunder 2003. Gore Ultimate Soldier. I don't even remember that game, and clearly it it did not endure. Oh, Masters of Orion 3. Well, that's a series that I never got into, but it's, I know a lot of people love it. It's sort of a, a grand space strategy series. The movies. The movies was um, uh, a very unique concept from uh, Peter Molyneux, he of Lionhead Studios, you know, um, creative uh, mind behind uh, the Fable and uh, Black and White and those games. And um, the movies was his movie making simulation game, I guess. Um, again, another one of those ones that I never played, but I do remember being quite hyped at the time. The Y Project, that is one that I do not remember. I am not sure what this is here. <laughs> Poor dog. I'm not sure. Oh, Anarchy Online. Yeah, so Anarchy Online was an early, um, well, one of, one of the earlier-ish MMOs, I guess. It was a, a sci-fi thing. Uh, I never played it, but I had a friend who was big into Anarchy Online. Best MMORPG 2001, according to PC Gamer. Shadow Bane. That is a game that rings a very vague bell in my memory. But it says here all characters are motion captured, including these guys by the trebuchet used during sh city sieges. Um, it was another MMO, it looks like. This was sort of the, the era in which MMOs really came into their own, um, and there's this proliferation of them in the early 2000s. Um, some really cool ones at the time, and obviously World of Warcraft is the one that, uh, that really defined that era and became the juggernaut that it, that it remains to this day, which is incredible when you think about it. Electronics Boutique ad. That graphic design, though. Earth and Beyond Online, another one of those MMOs of that era. Here is an ad for Dungeon Siege over here. And, uh, you can see they're playing up that sort of party-based combat aspect. I will say that the actual combat and the mechanics underpinning it were very simple at the time. They were really stripped down from a lot of the crunchier RPGs. It really was an action RPG, but uh, for me at the time, uh, you know, that was awesome. That was, I was really into that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was
us more into, I guess, the world they are presenting than the mechanics of the, uh, you know, the combat and that sort of thing. It was a great adventure. It really was a great adventure. The sum of all fears. A Tom Clancy game. I don't remember that one. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, reading about it like this, but I, I don't think I ever played it. Oh yes, Magic the Gathering Online. So this was Magic the Gathering's first foray into online play. And uh, even at the time, I seem to remember, um, it was pretty dated looking. Um, but um, I think I did play it a bit uh, at the time. I do remember, uh, you know, uh, vaguely um, playing it at one point, but I guess MTG Arena is sort of the modern incarnation of this. Uh, the release meter over here. This is kind of kind of fun. Let's see what games were coming out at that time. So the release meter for June um, 2002. Rayman Arena, Worms Blast, Legion, Neverwinter Nights. Return to Castle Wolfenstein, Game of the Year, Hero X, I don't know what that was, Siberia, that was kind of a neat adventure game, Hotel Giant, Unreal Tournament 2003, Le Mans, 24 Hours, Survivor Marquesas, a Survivor game, sure, Moonbase Commander, Operation Flashpoint, which is sort of a military simulation type series of shooters, Tropico, the original, and Warcraft 3. Icewind Dale 2 in July. Battlefield 1942, you guys. That kicked off the Battlefield series. Mafia. Mech Warrior 4 expansion. I played a lot of that at my friend's place. All kinds of other stuff in here, too. Medieval Total War is pictured up here. That was the follow-up to uh, the original Shogun Total War, which obviously has now grown into a series covering many settings and time periods, and uh, perhaps best known now as the Warhammer Total War, or Total War Warhammer series. Uh, Warcraft 3 was so cool at the time, you guys. It was so good. I feel. 
feel like I feel like there's a, a market for RTS and you know the old the old guard who's still playing Age of Empires 2 um, Definitive Edition and whatnot but I feel like there's a certain retro chic to RTS these days I think it could do well so I assume that this game is about America's army or this article is about the game America's army um, I'm just trying to see yes yes the army is getting into the game business so America's army was um, basically a recruitment tool it was a, a free-to-play game back when free-to-play wasn't really a thing but the US military put out this game free um, it was a multiplayer shooter and uh, it was quite popular at the time actually probably because it was free but it, it was designed as a recruitment tool and I don't think they ever really tried to pretend it was anything else you know um, I, I think I read something just a few months back like earlier this year, they were finally shutting down the last America's Army servers. So that means it had about a 20 year run, which is pretty freaking incredible. I never played it. I'm not much of one for like military shooters, but. It was a pretty big deal at the time. Here's a full-page ad, or spread, for GTA 3. Oh, and here's an ad for Falcon Northwest Gaming PCs. I remember these were such just lust-worthy PCs. I drooled over these things back in the day. They were uh, sort of the premier boutique builder for like beautiful, super, like ultra high performance PCs. Um, you know, which at the time cost thousands of dollars and that was a lot to spend on a PC then. Um, and they had these beautiful custom paint jobs and aluminum chassis and stuff like that at a time when other companies really didn't. So, you know, you must remember this was only about th three years removed from just the typical beige box era, you know, of the 90s. Um, here's a feature on how to run the perfect game in Neverwinter Nights. It was, of course, multiplayer, right? So the DM would could, could run a game. You could use the Aurora tool set to create an adventure and then run the game while the player characters were also connected and, and playing through. Pretty cool. And sort of shocking that we haven't seen anything else like that since. Now Neverwinter Nights 2 might have done something similar. I actually don't recall, but like what we really need and what I do believe Wizards of the Coast is actually working on still is um, you know, a digital tabletop version of D&D where you could do this kind of stuff, I guess um, you know, but a little more like the actual tabletop game, I suppose it's just crazy to me that we haven't seen this done in a major way really since Wolfenstein, that was pretty fun. I remember playing through a lot of it uh, in co-op with my buddy on his Xbox, I think it was. Oh, here we've got some early 2000s Dell boxes. Pentium 3s, Pentium 4s, 256 megs of RAM. 40 gigabyte hard drives. And now we're into the review 
section. They sort of always laid out their review scale here. Okay, this is fun. This, uh, this sidebar here says bust out your wallet, free up some time. These recent games are still worth checking out. Recent? I don't know about Jedi Knight being recent, but Warlords Battlecry 2 from June 2002. Rally Trophy. I don't remember that game from April 2002. And Jedi Knight from way back in December 1997. But the original Jedi Knight, which is actually the second Dark Forces game, was so good. I played the crap out of that game. Uh, an enduring classic uh, in Star Wars gaming history. It says here, been playing Jedi Knight 2, but never tried the original. This awesome FPS is still widely available for 10 bucks. And is also included in the Jedi Knight 2 Collector's Edition. So, yeah, I guess Jedi Knight 2 must have come out just prior to this. I can't remember when exactly that game dropped, but in this time frame. And, um, and that game was also amazing. Incredibly good. Um, the lightsaber combat in Jedi Knight 2 was just next level. Oh my gosh, you guys, there's too much. There's too much here. I could talk about every one of these pages. I could do a video on every page. Just going on about the the old hardware, the the aesthetics of that old hardware, and just the old games. And, the, and here we have the GTA 3 review. Now, I don't actually have a lot of nostalgia for GTA 3 because I did not play it at the time except for like a little bit over at my friend's place um, on his PS2 I guess it was um, and I, honestly at the time I think I probably wanted to play it but I think it was the kind of thing where my I don't think my parents wanted me to have it. Um, you know, I would have been, I guess, like 14 or something like that. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess they just, I think there was a sort of stigma around it, it uh, being very, very violent, you know, which it was, to be fair. Um, and I don't know that I ever really about it, but I just, I guess I knew that it wasn't something they would want me playing at the time. And, um, maybe it just didn't interest me all that much. Like, I, I think I did want to play it because I think the concept of it was really cool to me at the time because it was one of the first games to kind of do this open world, urban, um, playground kind of, uh, thing. But, um, but also, I was very much more into the fantasy stuff at the time, too, so... It says here, PC Graphics delivered the ultimate version of the PS2 breakout hit. Uh, okay, so wait, when did this launch on PS2? Maybe it came out substantially later on PC. I don't... I actually don't know. That would be good to know, though. So their final verdict on it was 92%. The highs, they say, totally freeform environment and mission structures, PC optimized graphics and gameplay tweaks, intense fun with tons of cool <laughs> lows, no PC specific help features and limited save slots. Bottom line, a revolutionary game design is serving up a badass crime saga. 92%. So yeah, I guess the PC port must have followed on sometime after the original console release, but I don't remember. Well, it says right here, last year, so it must have come out in 2001 sometime. 
so I suppose the PC port followed about a year later. Yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like I missed out on on something that was really pivotal, you know, uh, at the time in not playing GTA, but and honestly, I've never really gotten into the series since then, so I don't know. But it is obviously one of the best-selling series of all time, so. Ah, uh, here we have an Icewind Dale 2 spread. The original Icewind Dale was developed by, uh, Black Isle, I guess. And was in the Bioware Infinity engine. I don't think Bioware actually developed it. I think Black Isle did the development, but it was a it was a 2D uh, Dungeons and Dragons game, and um, a little more action oriented than uh, Baldur's Gate, for example. But in that vein, you know. And um, I have played a good chunk of Icewind Dale. I did not actually ever play Icewind Dale too. But it would be cool to go back and check it out. I think it was thought to be pretty good. Pretty good. Oh dear. <laughs> you know it was not pretty good. Might and Magic 9. I feel like this might have been the swan song for the Might and Magic series, which uh, for a long time was, uh, you know, a major, a real juggernaut in uh, RPGs, but uh, it sort of um, lost its luster over time, and it it never really um, regained its former position. Um, and other, you know, series sort of usurped its throne, <laughs> like the Elder Scrolls, you know. PC Gamer says, huge game world with lots to do, places to go, and people to see, but extreme lack of detail and vibrancy hinders every aspect of the game. It also had an extremely slow start, apparently. 51% merely okay. Yeah, I never played it, but... FDNY Firefighter. <gasps> 6%, you guys. 6% simply don't bother. There was uh, Shuffleware back in the day as well, of course. 6%. Carnivore's Cityscape. A dinosaur shooter. Is that what this is? 20%. Oh my gosh. That's a brutal batch of reviews on this page. Now I kind of want to go back. You know, just see if, if I can download some of those things, those old, old games, abandoned where, and just see, just check them out. Um, PC hardware, anyone? This is literally just a giant ordering list of, of hardware and prices. Again, this was started during that transitional era where a lot of, you know, commerce was moving online, but it wasn't fully there yet, so this is pretty amazing. Just a time capsule of cool old hardware. Radeon cards, GeForce 2 and 3 cards, a GeForce 4 TI 4600. <gasps> Pardon me. Pardon me. That, that would have been top of the line at the time. I just want to spend time looking at all this stuff, you guys. Army Men, the RTS, 57%. Blood Omen 2, 71%. That was kind of a third person action thing, right? Casino Mogul, 42%. Lots of pretty scathing reviews here. Duke Nukem Manhattan Project. This was a side scrolling Duke Nukem that, um, I guess was supposed to be kind of like the, the classic Duke Nukem's of yore before Duke Nukem 3D. Apparently it wasn't too bad. <laughs> what, what is this? Oh man. Disarming bombs will make the sexy dames in distress jiggle and coo their appreciation to chick magnet Mr. Nukem. 
Yikes. Um, I mean, that is, I guess, on brand for Duke Nukem, but yikes. BCT Commander. Now, this is a crunchy looking military strategy game, but uh, apparently they liked it 88%. A baseball game. Just some more EP games. Ads. Spider-Man. Was this a movie tie-in? Yes, I think it might have been a movie tie-in. And apparently it was actually pretty good. I didn't play this, but sumptuous 3D graphics and flawless animations. Great aerial combat, superb voiceovers. Limited camera control, no in-mission saves, some awkward control issues. Apparently it was pretty good. A Hitchcock game. Apparently not great. Diggles, the myth of Fenris. What the heck is a diggle? runaway watchdog and a motley gang of dwarves. That's the bizarre premise behind Diggles, a very weird real strategy game that challenges you to nurture a race of little gnomes so that they can successfully dig deep down into the earth's crust to find the disobedient hellhound Fenris. Sure, I guess. Why not? Yeah, that is a series that I don't think has stood the test of time since I don't remember it. Mega Race 3. This is sort of a wipeout looking kind of thing. Golf Resort Tycoon 2. Yeah, Tycoon games were really big at the time. Uh, based on, I guess, the success, the breakout success of Roller Coaster Tycoon. Tactical Ops Assault on Terror. Now that is a that is a very generic hoorah kind of mishmash of terms. Apparently not that great. And here we arrive finally at uh, the reason, the real reason that I I picked this this year. Uh, issue of the magazine. We have the review for The Elder Scrolls 3, Morrowind. Um, this, as far as I can recall, was yeah my first exposure to The Elder Scrolls, the first time I had read about it or heard about it. But um, it left uh, quite the impression on me because I specifically remember this review, like to this day. <laughs> um, I remember the screenshot, but uh, yeah, this would of course kick off, uh, you know, a love of, of the Elder Scrolls, which persists to this day. Um, let's, do you guys want to read this thing in full? I think we should. I think that would be pretty fun. Let's, let's give this thing a, a complete read from start to finish. The Elder Scrolls Three: Morrowind. Well worth the wait and the money, it says, even for fans who will need to buy a powerful new machine. Yes, if you can believe it, The Elder Scrolls Three uh, at the time, Morrowind was was quite taxing on the hardware and quite impressive in its scope and, and detail and, uh, and all that, and even graphically in some ways, although it was kind of ugly in others, even for the time. It earned a PC Gamer Editor's Choice Award. Vital Stats, role-playing game, rated teen from Bethesda. Uh, system requirements, you guys ready for some good stuff here? A Pentium 3, 500 MHz, 128 megabytes of RAM, uh, 256 megabytes of RAM. I'm not sure why it has both. Uh, a gig of hard drive 
have space. Oh my gosh, you guys. Um, and at least 32 megs of onboard memory for your, your 3D card. The recommended spec, however, um, Pentium 4 or an Athlon 1800 plus, 256 megs of RAM, and 64 megabyte GeForce 3 card. I'll tell you what I didn't have when I first played it. Uh, I was playing this on a Riva TNT 2, I believe, to start with. here. High hopes can come crashing down hard, which is why I was prepared to be disappointed by Morrowind. Besides the obvious technical hurdles that come with the game's exceedingly ambitious 3D world, I was half convinced that there was simply no way the gameplay could be as freeform as promised. Boy, was I worried for nothing. With more than 40 hours invested exploring Morrowind, which is not really that much for a Morrowind playthrough, honestly, I'm pleased to report that my fears have dissolved, and I'm happily absorbed by one of the most immersive first-person RPGs I've ever experienced. Morrowind is perhaps the most technologically cutting-edge first-person RPG ever, and it naturally pushes the limits of current hardware and still keeps pushing. My Windows XP 1.1 GHz Athlon system with 256 megs of RAM and a 64 megabyte GeForce 2 card was able to run the game adequately. <laughs> 10 to 20 FPS on average. Apparently that's adequate. How our standards have shifted <laughs> over time. But I did have to turn down some visual and audio settings. Expect to encounter some fairly significant issues, such as occasional fatal crashes, if you've got a sound card that isn't completely DirectX 8.1 compatible, like mine. You may experience some in-game... Oh, and if you've got a sound card that isn't completely DX 8.1 compatible, you may experience some in-game audio anomalies. Thankfully, following the tips in the game's README file, I'll solve to my so sound problems. You start as a newly freed slave in the province of Vardenfell, where you, uh, where the entire game is set. Uh, really, it's the province of Morrowind, the island of Vardenfell, but it's okay. You're unsure of your own past and oblivious to the reasons why the Emperor has released you. At the very outset, you're interviewed by Imperial Guards, and your answers to their questions shape the character you play in the game. Without giving more away, let's just say that the character generation system brilliantly sets the tone for the level of immersion you can expect from the rest of the adventure. From there, you're pushed to begin following the game's main quest, which paints you as the principal savior in uniting a land torn by political infighting and years of racial hostilities. Robert Jordan would be proud of the complexities here. May he rest in peace. However, right at the start and throughout the rest of the game, you can choose the pace at which you pursue this core objective. Morrowind offers plenty of subquests to track down and complete. There are mage, fighter, and thief guilds to join, among others. You can be a champion of good, the vilest of thieves, or something, or someone in between. It really is up to you how you play the game, and ultimately what you get out of it. And honestly, the level of freedom that Morrowind offered in that regard, um, it was uh, innovative uh, for the time, and it kind of remains innovative to this day. Um, Morrowind really went for it in terms of the freedom that they gave you. Uh, even the freedom to screw up your, your playthrough and, uh, you know, irreversibly mess things up so you could not complete the main quest. set in one province or that it ships on a single CD fool you into thinking it's a short ride. There is so much to discover and see that 
I'd conservatively estimate 100 hours of exploring, at the very least, at the very least. You play the game largely by yourself. You have no other party members to micromanage. On occasion, you'll meet, an NP you'll meet NPCs that will join you for a time. This grouping not only relieves management tedium, but also adds to the immersion. You play just one character, so you really begin to identify with that persona and care what happens to him or it. Really though, it's the lushly detailed 3D worlds that set a new standard for this kind of RPG. There are many, oh, uh, there are day-night cycles, booming thunderstorms, blinding sandstorms, ash storms really, ash storms. An almost obscene array of flora and fauna, which you can't stop, or um, well, you can't stop to actually smell the flowers, you can pick them, and a commendable level of architectural variety. After a few hours, Marwyn begins to feel like a living, breathing world. What does this caption over here say? You'll want help dealing with these guys. At the very least, don't engage in melee alone if you're below level 9 or 10. I mean, maybe don't engage these guys in melee alone, but <laughs> you're gonna have to engage something in melee. Morrowind ingredients, 3,244 NPCs, 6 standard sized novels worth of text, 300 plus dungeons, 316,042 hand placed objects, 480 billion total number of different characters you can play. 500 plus basic spells, and 150 billion additional spells you can create. Of course, those are just very small variations, you know, but the numbers are impressive. Dwarven ruins are ripe with cool stuff to plunder. Just make sure you're strong enough to fight for it. Sometimes it's best to let your pals do the fighting and step in only when needed and to pick up the loot. <laughs> slightly from the immersion, however. NPCs don't react to the passage of time. You can go into any guild, store, house, and so on at any time of day, and you'll find the same people there. It's true. I would have liked to see stores locked up at dusk, forcing you to look uh, to black markets for goods if you couldn't wait. Now, of course, that's uh, something they added in the subsequent Elder Scrolls games. You know, um, stores would close up at night time. Um, but I guess they just didn't do it in Morrowind. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I would have preferred more autonomy with the NPCs. It'd be fun to see them go about their own business rather than you know, know that you can always find Gary down at the corner bar, for example. Yeah, that's something they very much expanded into with Oblivion. Uh, to somewhat hilarious results. <laughs> you know, Oblivion is memed on for a good reason. Which is the NPC AI was ambitious, but occasionally very wonky. Finally, the AI pathfinding is pretty poor. Monsters often get hopelessly confused by an object, such as a rock, directly in their path, repeatedly bumping into it instead of merely sidestepping it. This problem isn't a huge deal, but it can kick your ass when you have an NPC tagging along. In my case, a companion, whose company was crucial to completing a certain quest, kept walking into a pool of lava and killing herself. Uh, Elder Scrolls games never change. They've been janky forever in, in those ways. That said, the NPCs do react to your actions and remember what you do, which is pretty awesome. For instance, I stole a gem from a trader's bedroom early in the game and several weeks later returned to that same trader and sold it to him, forgetting where I'd pilfered it from. He recognized the jewel as his, and understandably, all hell broke loose. Uh, it was a startling but pleasant surprise. Weirdly, uh, 
the game is missing a few basic tools that most of us RPGers have come to expect. There's no simple way to annotate the game maps, for example, nor is there any simple way to sort quests by level of completion via the journal interface. Yeah, the journal interface was very much designed to be, you know, um, immersive, I suppose, but not super functional, <laughs> we'll say. Um, there are so many things to do, it does become difficult tracking your progress, that is fair. Finally, combat may be too integral a part of the game for players interested mainly in exploration and character development. Throughout the game, nearly every creature and lots of NPCs will attack you on sight. Uh, with no provocation. Thankfully, the combat itself never became a headache for me. Which is interesting because it was one of the greater um, criticisms of the game. Uh, you know, in subsequent years. Um, on the whole, my complaints don't even come close to eclipsing Morrowind's core goodness. It's revolutionary in its detail and in its freeform nature. I'll still be playing it months, if not years, from now. That's for sure. And here we are playing it 20 years later. Um, you know, I do play it on stream uh, over at twitch.tv slash the ASMR nerd, which there's a link down below this video if you'd like to click on through. Uh, I stream there on Sunday nights and sometimes on Thursday nights as well. And, uh, it would be awesome to see you guys there. If you've not been, I'd love to see you there. Um, and Morrowind is one of the games that I play there pretty regularly. So I think it's safe to say uh, Morrowind endured the test of time. We have a few... We have a few uh, more screenshots here. Clipping problems be gone. That armor, but no weapon. The guy's gonna punch you. And the journal logs conversations clearly. It does, but quests less so. The landscape is dotted with tombs, but be warned, the inhabitants don't like being disturbed. Oh, yes, the House of Earthly Delights in Suran. I can't believe there's no PC Gamer editors here. Oh boy. Yes. But, uh, I do remember finding that in my first playthrough. Uh, when you see cool gear, you simply must have it. And that hasn't changed. System specs for Daggerfall. Which, obviously, was the prequel. The one that came before. 486DX2. 8 megs of RAM. A 256 color VGA card. And 50 megs of hard drive space, also rated 90% in the December 1996 issue, whereas Morrowind, uh, 90%, <laughs> uh, high is incredibly detailed and beautiful game world, tons of things to do and ways to play, loads, some technical issues, no map annotation, quest sorting can be tedious, a bit too much combat. Bottom line, Morrowind is the new standard upon which all first-person RPGs will be based. I mean, he called it. <laughs> well done, Steve Klett. You were absolutely right. Indeed it was. And that, my friends, is the Morrowind review from 2002 in PC Gamer Magazine. All around, I'd say a very fair review, and uh, pretty pretty prescient about the um, role that game would play in the future of of RPGs. Uh, this one's pretty funny, or pretty fun, I should say. This is uh, gives a, a spec list for an entry level system, a mid a mid range system, and a dream system from July two thousand two. Some of these specs are amazing. Incredible. Oh man. I just. <laughs> uh, the good old days. I don't know. I have a soft spot for, for vintage art. 
hardware as well, retro hardware. I would like to have like a retro hardware corner of my own someday where I have a little, you know, handful of PCs perhaps um, from throughout the years. Gamers Edge PX 2100A, a dream level PC. Some speakers. Flat panel display for games, question mark. At this time, CRTs were still the de facto sort of choice for most gamers. Um, the image quality was much better on CRTs at the time. It took quite a few more years for flat panels to really take over um, as the, the primary gaming displays. Uh, some classic Alienware ads. A bunch of tech questions. I don't remember Orb. I buy power. I think they're still around. Some opinion pieces. RPG past versus future. Hey, there's a screenshot of Dungeon Siege. It really was a pretty game at the time. says here, Dungeon Siege is a great choice for new players interested in embarking on a role-playing career, but it left this veteran player wanting more complexity, which is fair. It was a very simple game uh, in terms of its, you know, combat mechanics, but it was really all about the setting and the exploration and just the, the adventure for me. Some Dungeon Siege strategy stuff. Some secret areas. Oh, I freaking love it. Puzzle dungeons and flooded dungeon. I remember this one along the path to the crypts. This one in the ice caves, the Alpine Caverns. One day I'd really like to do some Dungeon Siege content on this channel. Um, I know not many people remember the game, and it probably won't be like a very popular series of videos if I do end up doing it, but I have such fond memories of this game, and I just think it would be really cool um, to revisit it and share it with some people who've maybe never heard of it or seen it before. I think even to this day, it is a good adventure. Yes, there is a secret chicken level, which I guess is a reference to the secret cow level in Diablo 2, you know. There's some pretty incredibly huge dungeons in there. Pretty epically crazy. And some GTA 3 strategy and stuff as well. Um, a couple of the other 
issues I picked out are ones that, uh, one had the review for the original Call of Duty game, which obviously was a landmark uh, event, um, went on to spawn one of the biggest franchises in history. Um, I have the episode with the, or the episode, the issue with the review of Oblivion, The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, um, which would be really fun to look at as well. And just so many others with just these legendary, iconic games that at the time, you know, we had no way of knowing the legacy that they were going to spawn, but um, in retrospect are just these these absolute legends in gaming history, as well as just the nostalgia of looking at all these other forgotten games or, shh, stomach quiet, <laughs> or, um, you know, uh, vintage hardware, retro PC stuff. I just love it, and uh, I hope you guys uh, do too. So please let me know if you would like to see more videos like this. It would be my pleasure to go through more of these magazines with all of you. And of course, big shout out to this video's sponsor, Into the AM. You guys couldn't see it, but I've been wearing an Into the AM t-shirt this whole time. You can check out their amazing graphic tees and all their other cool gear over at uh, their website. There's a link down below in the video description and that link or using coupon code the ASMR nerd will save you 10% on uh, all your purchases there. So. Um, check that out. Alright, thanks for uh, joining me here, my friends. I do hope you enjoyed this uh, trip down memory lane, and I look very forward to seeing you back here next time. Bye for now, guys.